The what? I just need to get this over here working. Does that look crazy? <laughs> you look very professional. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I look crazy. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear okay with this whole contraption? Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk, as she said, about ambulatory neurology for the PCP. There's a whole lot of stuff I would love to tell you guys about, but I thought this would probably be the most useful for the, a broad audience. Um, so we'll talk about this. I don't have any disclosures. I have no financial interest. Trust me. Um, so we'll start. <laughs> um, so today, I have a ton of things I would love to talk to you about. I've recently shortened this, so hopefully we'll get through it. Um, but I'm gonna review very quickly the components of a pediatric neurology exam, for those of you who it's been a while. Different types of seizures that we see a lot in childhood. A Little bit about use of EEG, a little bit about headaches, and a little bit about tics. I'd say these are, by and large, the most common things that we're gonna see in clinic, um, and that you are most likely to see in a pediatrics or family medicine clinic. So I always put this slide up every time I do a presentation because people love to say, I'm going to refer them to the pediatric neurologist and they'll take care of it. But it is important that you guys know that the wait times for pediatric neurology are very long. Um, at studies that have been done in private practice, they're up to nine weeks in academic institutions or three to four months to see a pediatric neurologist. So the ability of the pediatrician to take hold of these basic bread and butter issues is invaluable. So this is something I hope you'll be more comfortable with shortly. Um, so the pediatric neurology exam. Everyone says, this is a really tough exam. How do I do, what do I do with a six month old? So we're not gonna go into detail, but just some basic reminders. So vital signs that you, a neurologist is interested in. A weight and a head circumference. All that other stuff, as long as it's fine, I don't care. Um, a skin exam is a really important component of a neurologic exam for looking for neurocutaneous stigmata, things that could cause seizures. Um, and then there are seven parts to kind of a complete neurologic exam, and they are listed here, mental status, cranial nerves, motor, sensory, coordination, gait, and reflexes. So I get a lot of panicked phone calls. People are trying to tell me about a patient and they're kind of like the pupils and the tone and are kind of all over the place. So it's really not that hard. I know a lot of people aren't very comfortable with a neurologic exam and that's okay. Um, but just go through these seven parts that we just listed. Each time, tell us the best you can about each of those and you'll have tell, told us a fairly complete neurologic exam. Okay, so again, when you're thinking about doing each of these parts, it's not impossible, you just have to be creative, okay? Does the kid track? Do they reach for stuff? Will do the heavy taxi when they reach for it? Can they climb on the table? Well, that means their legs are pretty strong, right? So you can look at different things that they're doing. They yawn, well, their palate elevates symmetrically, okay? So just watch the kid and let them kind of tell you the information that you need to know. 
So now we're going to move into seizures. First, we're going to talk about a first-time unprovoked seizure, which is really, really basic um, stuff for the pediatrician who is going to see a lot of these come to their clinic. So we always talk about everyone gets a free seizure. That's fine. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. There are times when that's not true. But when you have a first-time seizure, everybody needs an MRI of their brain without contrast and a routine EEG. These are studies in a stable patient who looks fine. They don't have to be done immediately. They can be done as an outpatient. Um, but they're studies that should be done probably within the next few weeks. A patient who has had a first-time seizure, who has a normal exam, a normal EEG, and a normal MRI, does not need to see a neurologist. That patient may never have another seizure, and the number of first-time seizures in kids is dramatic. There is no way I could see every kid that has a first-time seizure, okay? So it's important that you take hold of this, realize that these are the guidelines. If they look fine and these studies are fine, they are fine, okay? Typically with a first-time seizure, we're not going to start an anti-epileptic medication again because of a large majority of them are never going to have another one. There are special circumstances where we might consider starting an anti-epileptic after a first-time seizure, a really abnormal EEG a big brain tumor or a big spot on their MRI is pretty significant. We know they're probably going to have another seizure. Or if they show up and they had a one-time seizure, but it went on for three days and they're intubating the PICU, we're probably going to start an anti-epileptic. Okay? So there are exceptions, obviously, um, which are basically common sense exceptions. All kids with a first-time seizure should go home with a rescue medicine. We'll talk about rescue medicines a little bit more later. Um, but until they prove that they're not going to start having a seizure a week, they should go home with a rescue medicine. So obviously, if a patient comes to you, they're ill-appearing, they're not returning to baseline, they have a focal exam, that's a whole different story. Okay, that patient needs to go to the ED, that patient needs to be worked up, that patient needs imaging, et cetera, in the next 24 hours. So we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about febrile seizures a little bit, and there are two types of febrile seizures. There's a simple febrile seizure and a complex febrile seizure. But first of all, what is a febrile seizure? So a febrile seizure is just a seizure that goes with fever, okay? And that's a person in a person who doesn't look like they have meningitis, who doesn't have encephalitis, okay? They're well appearing, but they've had a, a seizure in the setting of fever. And this occurs in children who are six months to six um, 60 months old, so six months to five years old. So when you call me and you say, I have a seven-year-old that had a febrile seizure, no, you didn't, okay, because you don't have a febrile seizure if you're that old, okay? Within this limit is okay. Out of this limit, we're worried that there's something else going on. A febrile seizure will happen in up to 5% of all children. So same thing. It's really important that this is something that primary care providers really grab a hold of and learn how to deal with, okay, because it's very, very common. So what makes the difference between a simple and a complex febrile seizure? Simple febrile seizure is not focal, so it's generalized. All the arms, all the legs were shaking. It's less than 15 minutes, and there's only one in 24 hours. A complex febrile seizure is just the opposite, right? So it's long, or it's focal, or it has multiple back-to-back. So the risk of epilepsy in a patient who has had a simple febrile seizure is only slightly higher than the general population. Most of them will never have a recurrence, but at least a third of them will. And some patients actually get to where they have febrile seizures almost every time they have a febrile illness, okay? And that's something that a lot of those pe people will still be able to outgrow. So the big question is, what about an LP? Because we talk about a patient who is febrile, who's shown up with a seizure, do I shrug it off and say no big deal? Or do I say this patient needs more workup? So here's when I would consider an LP. There's no, never a perfect right or wrong answer, but I would consider it. In a patient who obviously looks like they have meningitis, who does not look well. In a patient who is under six months old, there are some varying guidelines on how hard and fast this is, but think about it if the patient is under six months old. If the patient has been kind of pre-treated with antibiotics and maybe they have meningitis, but we're kind of masking it, or if they're not appropriately vaccinated for their age. Those are times when you have a fever and a seizure and you might want to be a little more suspicious. Otherwise, two-year-old comes in, has a febrile seizure, looks great in your office, what are you going to do? You're not going to do anything, okay? They don't need an EEG. They don't need an MRI. They don't need a CT. They don't need labs. They need nothing, okay? They need to treat their fever. They need to go home and get better. That's all they need. 
Um, sometimes we will send kids home who have had long um, febrile seizures with a rescue medicine like diazepam, which we'll talk about more. A lot of times I wait until the kid has had a couple of them because, again, a lot of kids are never going to have another one. It's a very expensive medicine in the wrong hands. It could be a dangerous medicine. Um, and so usually I'll wait till they've had two or three febrile seizures and or their very long seizures before I go ahead and give them a rescue medicine. So a patient who has simple febrile seizures, who is doing well, who has had the appropriate workup, which is nothing except an exam, right, does not need to be seen by neurology or followed by neurology. Complex febrile seizures are different. So in a patient who comes in who's had a focal seizure, multiple seizures, long seizures, I have a lower threshold to do an LP, okay? They definitely need a routine EEG. And that can be done as an outpatient as well if they are well appearing. If an EEG is abnormal, then we will image a patient with a complex febrile seizure. So if it's focal um, or there are sharps on it that make us worried, that's when we image them. Same thing about rectal diazepam. Sometimes I wait until they've had a couple to really prove that they're going to be a, a repeat offender or if it's really long before I give it to them. And patients with complex febrile seizures are usually followed at least peripherally by a pediatric neurologist so that we can follow up the studies, make sure things are kind of going in the right direction, and also make sure that there are not other subtleties that make us more concerned about an underlying epilepsy. So febrile seizure prophylaxis has kind of come into being in the last 20 years. And the first studies on this were done in the 90s. And those were done with oral Valium or diazepam. And other studies have been done. Our most favorite thing that we usually use today is clonopin or clonazepam. It has good ease of administration. The sizes that the tablets come in are easy. But the idea behind febrile seizure prophylaxis is a kid who every single time they get sick, they have, a, they have a febrile seizure. Or every time they get sick, they have five febrile seizures. So you have a patient who you kind of, you know, you're going to get sick. Um, and you can bridge these people, so to speak, by giving them three days worth of medication while they're at the height of their illness to try to get them through without many or any uh, febrile seizures. Antipyretics do not prevent febrile seizures. And this is a point of great confusion among some people, but they don't. We want to treat their fever, obviously, but febrile seizures occur with changes in fever. They occur often even before you even know you have a fever. And so giving Tylenol to prevent it is not going to help. Okay? So we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about chronic seizure patients. Now, these are patients you're not going to primarily be managing, right? These are neurology patients. Um, but you're going to see them, and you're going to see the medicines that they're on. And so I want you to be familiar with kind of the basic concepts. So first of all, patients with epilepsy have seizures. And I know that sounds silly, but I get a lot of panicked phone calls. The patient with epilepsy had a seizure. I know they have epilepsy. So it's OK, OK? <laughs> There's no need to panic, all right, because they are going to have breakthrough seizures, just like a migraine patient is going to have a headache, OK? Um, and so these are things that are managed over the telephone. We're going to change their medications. If they're well appearing, we're going to make little tweaks to their regimen. But it's not something they need to rush into the office for, OK? Why do they have a breakthrough? That's probably the most important thing to get to the bottom of. So typical things, are they not compliant? Do they throw up their medicine? They're sick, they've grown a whole lot, or they're using sedating antihistamine medicines that lower their seizure threshold with Benadryl being the biggest offender. Um, so these are things that are gonna be typical. You can usually get to the bottom of it with these questions, quite frankly. Um, of note, people will have increasing seizures around puberty. We don't know why. It's not because they're not taking their medicine. It's not because we don't know how to manage their medicine. They just do. There's a lot of changes going on. And so sometimes that's just a time period. We have to get through the best we can. So obviously, any chronic seizure patient can have a bad, scary reason to have seizures, just like anyone else. So if they look infected, if they have a shunt and they're vomiting, if they had trauma to their head, anything like that, we need to think about, is there another reason that they're having seizures? So what do we do about it? So I said, OK, you call me, and I say we change it on the phone, OK, which is true, but when do we change it? So if you've missed a medicine, we're not going to adjust your medicine, OK, because you, don't, you aren't taking it. If you threw it up or you're febrile or you're really sick and that's why you're having seizures, we might give you a bridge during that febrile illness, but we're not going to change your underlying medicine. If you are taking your medicines and you look good and everything else is going fine, that's when we're going to change your medicine. That's when we know that you need more medicine. And AED levels are not helpful. Okay, They are helpful in status when you're reloading a patient, 
But people call and say, I got all these levels. And I say, okay, what do you want me to do with them? So if a patient is seizing, they need more medicine. If they're having side effects, they need less medicine. That's all I need to know, okay? So you adjust AEDs based on seizures and based on side effects. So a patient who has had a breakthrough seizure then does not need to rush into clinic, either your clinic, quite frankly, or my clinic, okay? They need to call, we need to adjust their medicine, and they need to go on their way. When we talk about weaning, there's a lot of questions in children because a lot of kids are able to ultimately get off of seizure medicines. So when we think about are these kids, is, is this a kid that I could wean off of medicine? Um, we know that we typically look for a two year seizure freedom time frame before we try to wean off of a medicine. And we also know that some kids have seizure syndromes or certain things that there is no way they're ever gonna get off of medicine and so we don't try it, okay? but. If we do decide that a patient is a candidate for weaning, we wean off very slowly. We wean off over eight to 10 weeks. And the reason for that is because sometimes a patient is well controlled on a medicine, they're not having seizures, we wean them off and when we restart the medicine, it doesn't work anymore, okay? So you've lost a medicine that was really helping that patient. So before you say, yeah, you're doing great, no need to see the neurologist, let's just wean, let's just stop it, okay? Consider that there may be long-term consequences, basically, to seizure control in a, in a poorly selected patient who's weaned off medicine. So rescue medicines, we're going to touch on very, just the top ones in the interest of time. So a rescue medicine is used for a seizure that is lasting over five minutes or a seizures that are occurring in clusters. So they're two minutes long, but they've had 10 in the last hour, okay? This, the idea, obviously, is to stop them from going into status. Um, and it can be repeated if a seizure is ongoing for a long time. The most common me medicine that is studied is rectal diazepam or diastat. There are lots of other ones that are also studied. They don't have as good a data, and some of them you have a lot of difficulty getting from the pharmacy or from an insurance perspective. So diastat or rectal diazepam comes in all of the different sizes that you can see listed up here. An acudial means that they come in a set where you actually have to twist it to get it to the right dose. So the family actually has to kind of twist it to get it appropriately. There is a dosing chart we're gonna look at. You can see it anywhere. You can Google it, okay, you don't have to call me. You can just put it in Google and you will find it. Um, and that is how we know how much to give people. It changes based on their age and based on their weight. Okay, and this is the chart that we're talking about. So you'll see that as you get older, the dose you need based on the way it's absorbed actually goes down, okay? People who are under two years old are not listed on this chart, but we do give it to people who are under two years old. We give diastat to people as young as six months old. We give them either 2.5 milligrams or five milligrams, kind of based on their weight, but we never give it to anybody under six months old. And the reason is that this medication can cause respiratory depression. And so in a patient that young, we're not willing to risk that at home. And so those folks are a little bit suspicious of really high doses. So I typically cap at 15. You, if I look at the chart and you're 17.5, I give you 15. Same idea, is it, is it a respiratory depression issue? Because it's a pretty high dose of a pretty strong medication. The only other medicine we're going to talk about for rescue medicine is oral disintegrating tablet clonopin or clonazepam. Um, it again is not as well studied, but is a really good medicine because if a patient is having a seizure, it dissolves in their mouth. And we all know that a 17 year old in the middle of the high school cafeteria is not going to get diastat, okay? It's just not going to happen. So it would be better if they got this medicine, which is semi-studied, than, than no medicine while they're waiting for EMS to come. And this is dosed based on this height of man rule. And so if you're adult size, you get two milligrams. If you're waist size, you get one milligram. If you are knee sized, you get half a milligram. And if you're in arm size, you get 0 0.25 milligrams for a rescue medicine to stop an ongoing seizure. So seizure safety briefly. So short seizures don't hurt you. Getting injured while you're having one does hurt you. And that's our main thing. So getting a kid into a safe position, making sure they're on their side. If they drool or they vomit, they don't aspirate. Timing the episode is the biggest thing I tell parents because they have no idea how long it lasted. It's, they say 10 minutes and it was 30 seconds. Big difference. Um, don't put anything in their mouth. Don't try to stop them. Okay, just let, let them seize. They're gonna be tired. 
we're going to be confused, but they should be trending back toward baseline. So they should be, if you pinch them, they should move. Over the next several minutes, they should start to kind of arouse a little bit. They may not be it themselves, but they're getting better. If a patient is not getting better, if you pinch them and nothing happens, they could be having subclinical seizures. So those patients need further assessment by 911. If a patient has a known seizure disorder and they have a seizure at home on our prior point and they are returning to baseline, even if it's slowly, they're groggy, but they're waking up, EMS may come see them if we're worried for some reason. EMS may not come see them, but in either circumstance, they don't need to come to the ED. They don't need to be admitted, okay? A patient who's returning to baseline just needs their seizure medicines adjusted. Other things that we talk about for kind of seizure, seizure safety, um, a shower is better than bathing for a drowning risk, okay? We don't let people swim in bodies of water we can't see them in if they were to have a seizure. We don't let them do rock climbing as their favorite sport, okay? Heights are a problem. If they can get their seizures under reasonable control, there's no reason they can't play sports, but they should be using safety rules like anyone else, okay? So should you be riding your bike without a helmet in the middle of the street? Probably not, but no 10-year-old should. Um, motorized vehicles is an important point as well. We think about driving, but sometimes we don't think about an ATV or something of that nature, other motorized vehicles, and so those are problematic. Most driving rules, they do vary by state. Most states will say it's six to 12 months of seizure freedom, and that would also apply to any time you're changing medicines. If you're weaning someone off of medicines, no, they haven't had a seizure, but they might be going to. Um, so any time you're making big changes, that's also a time of no driving. So common sense, if my kid had a seizure right now, what would happen? If it's bad, I probably shouldn't be doing it. <coughs> SUDEP is the last point about seizure safety. It's sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. And we don't actually know a lot about it. Um, but it is usually kids who have very poor control. You'll see here, less in children, higher at people who have been referred to huge epilepsy centers. The better you can control the epilepsy, the less likely this is going to happen. We, may, we don't really know what causes it, but it may be caused by heart issues, breathing issues, et cetera. They have a seizure in their sleep and die. This is what we're talking about. And there are some um, kind of guidelines that say that all epilepsy patients at some point should be told that this is a possibility. Um, and again, the better we can control your seizures, the less this possibility is. So we're going to talk now for a few minutes about seizure syndromes and hopefully have time for a little bit of headaches at the end. So these are syndromes that are common in childhood. Um, there are many of them. We've picked out about six. And you should be able to recognize essentially these syndromes or at least know what they are. The first one we're going to talk about, this is the list, but the first one is infantile spasms. And these are spasms that are flexor or extensor, meaning they flex or they extend, okay, spasms. And they typically start around six months of age. They're often confused with things that are cute or they made this little movement or they were whatever. Um, and they, the classic uh, kind of story is that they will happen in clusters and it'll happen when they're going to sleep or they're waking up, okay. This may be a developmentally normal kid. So everybody says, oh, well, they, they're doing fine. They are doing fine now, but they won't be doing fine for long. Okay, so they can be totally normal. Sometimes we find out what causes it, sometimes we don't. Looking at a kid like this can be very confusing. Sometimes it's very obvious they're having infantile spasms, sometimes it's not. And it's really important to identify this early to save their development, because if you can stop them, you can put them on an entirely different life track, okay? Classic finding that you've all heard of, hips arrhythmia, high, uh, high amplitude, very chaotic, very disorganized. Sometimes kids that are very affected in their development, you'll hear West syndrome is just the word. It just means they're very poor development and that they have infantile spasms. This is a picture of hips arrhythmia on the left, so you can see how high and ugly and chaotic that background is compared to the one on the right, which is essentially a normal uh, EEG. So if you're suspicious about infantile spasms, a patient needs workup in the next week. It's not an emergency at 3 in the morning, but they do need an EEG within the next week or so to start evaluating if this is actually an issue. And if we're really concerned, they may need a lot more workup. Prognosis depends on the cause. All infantile spasms go away. A lot of them turn into other really terrible seizure syndromes. Some of them go away and go on to be normal. So again, the sooner you can catch it, if you can stop it, you can really intervene on that kid. Next is Lennox-Gastaut. We're not going to talk about this in great detail. 
It is one of the seizure types that infantile spasms can become, and it has a lot of different seizure types in it, and it's very difficult to treat and very hard to control. All of these kids are developmentally abnormal. They all have kind of encephalopathy type picture, and that's really the gist of what you need to know. So if someone comes in, they have Lennox Gastaut, you know they're delayed, they have a lot of seizures, and they're very hard to control. This is a picture of a kid with Lennox Gastaut. You saw a four month old EEG just a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, but this is a kid who's just having this ongoing spikes and spike wave discharges. This is what we're talking about. And so I know you can all appreciate that it's abnormal, even if you can't tell me how, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so now we're actually going to talk about something called status epilepticus of sleep. And there's a lot of different syndromes that fall under this. But the idea is that some kids, when they go to sleep, get this spiking that won't go away. And if you can't rest and your brain can't go through normal sleep, you can't learn, your speech is messed up, your development is messed up. And sometimes these particular children will have seizures, and sometimes they won't. And this can be a major source of confusion because it typically starts between ages three and six, which is about the time we start diagnosing children with autism, okay? And so if a kid comes in and has had significant regression in language, whether or not they've had seizures, you should probably think about whether or not they could have electrical status epilepticus of sleep. And this is a picture of a patient I once had who has status epilepticus of sleep. And you can see that their sleep, instead of having sleep architecture like we've heard about, has essentially never ending spikes. So they're not gonna learn, they're not gonna talk, they're not gonna develop appropriately. If you can treat this, you can intervene on their development as well. Next, we have benign Rolandic epilepsy. It's now called benign childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. And that's because these kids have centrotemporal spiking, usually at night, and they present with seizures. And they typically present kind of in the late elementary school age. They're otherwise developmentally normal. It's considered a benign syndrome that you usually will outgrow. So again, the EEG, uh, the spikes that you see are typically during sleep. And so they will present with episodes at night. And this is very classic that people will be diagnosed with sleepwalking. And then they will come to me and they will say, my kid came into the room a couple of nights ago. They stood there. It seemed like they wanted to talk, but they couldn't. They were drooling. Their mouth was twitching a little bit. And I say, you have benign relentic epilepsy. Okay, so that is a very common story that people will tell you that have those components. Um, and it is very easily confused with sleepwalking. But if you hear that story, they seemed like they wanted to talk, but they couldn't. They were drooling. Their mouth was twitching. They need an EEG. Okay, they probably have epilepsy. These kids can have generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Sometimes they present with a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And you say, anything else weird happened? Oh, yeah, this weird episode, they came in my room. And then you'll realize, oh, I, that's actually what you have. Overall, it's a really good prognosis. People do tend to outgrow it. Sometimes an EEG is enough to actually diagnose it. And a lot of times these kids, if they're just having a few of these weird spells at night, we think they're going to outgrow it. They don't necessarily have to have AEDs. And so it's really a ongoing conversation with the family, how comfortable they are um, or not, whether or not these kids need treatment. Absence epilepsy is a common epilepsy you guys have all heard of. Petite mild seizures, okay, onset in elementary school kids. They're staring, the teachers worry, they're not paying attention. Um, this is something that often is also outgrown, but it's important to realize it's not always outgrown. So you have a kid and you say, oh, you're gonna outgrow it. Most of them will, but when they're 18, you're gonna be sending them to me because they're still having them, okay? So they don't all outgrow it. They're brief staring spells, they have behavioral rest. They can have what we call automatisms where they have blinking of the eyelids or picking motions of their shirt. Kind of they do the same thing over and over every time. They can last for a few seconds or they can be super subtle. And these kids can have ongoing EEG abnormalities even when we can't see it, that they are essentially not focusing on what you're saying ever throughout the day. They're having two seconds of normal on and off all day. Some hints, people will say, well, I called their name and they didn't respond. Well, maybe they weren't paying attention. So it's very important that you tell families when they come with a concern about a staring spell to give them a little pinch. It's not gonna kill them and we will know if they're actually having a seizure, okay? So if they pinch, if you pinch a kid and they're still staring and they're still not paying attention, I'm more interested and more concerned. You can also bring this out, this particular epilepsy syndrome, by a pinwheel or blowing on a tissue. So if you have a kid who comes, you're worried, this is what they have in your office, you can just have them blow on a tissue for about two minutes, big breaths, and if they have a little absence seizure in your office, you'll know that's what they have. 
Staring spells are not absent seizures, okay? This is my personal pet peeve. Um, an absent seizure is a three hertz spike in wave discharge on EEG. It's a specific discharge, and that specific discharge is treated with specific medications. A staring spell can be a complex partial seizure. It can be all kinds of stuff. And I know you're thinking, I don't care. I'm a pediatrician. But the truth is, if you call me and you say someone has absence epilepsy, I'm going to tell you a different medication recommendation than if you call me and say they have staring spells. I'm not sure why. Okay, so it's important to differentiate. And this is a kid who's having an absent seizure on the left. You can see these ongoing spike wave discharges. They're staring, they're not paying attention, whatever. At this point, they're immediately back to normal after it. It immediately stops and they look normal. So again, note that there are some other kinds that they may not outgrow it, that there may be different variations of it. Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, we call it JME. And it's a epilepsy that also occurs in normal children. Its onset is a little bit later. It's more of a 12 to 18 year old. It's easy to control, but they almost always need lifelong therapy. And it's also very important to identify because again, you can get good control of it, right? So you don't wanna miss a kid that you can really help. These kids are gonna have three different seizure types. Most of them are gonna show up in your office with a generalized tonic clonic seizure, you're gonna say they had a first time generalized sonic clonic seizure. If a 16 year old shows up who is otherwise normal and has a generalized sonic clonic seizure and has never had one before, you should ask the following. Do they have staring spells? The answer might be yes, might be no. Do they have early morning jerks? They're sitting at breakfast, their spoon flies out of their hand. The parents will have never heard this before. The kid will say, oh yeah, that totally happens to me. And the parent will say, I've never heard that before. And you'll say, you have JME, okay? Because again, there are certain medicines that treat this syndrome that can control it for the rest of their life, but you have to diagnose it correctly, okay, to get them on the right medicine. So those are the three questions. Early morning jerks, generalized tonic clonic seizures, or staring spells. These kids get in trouble when they go to college because sleep deprivation, alcohol, and sometimes photic stimulation can cause them to have seizures, okay? So these are the things we try to tell them to do a good job of doing or not doing to keep their epilepsy under control. Often in these kids, if looking back at, looking back at the timeline, they had absence type seizures first, then they had the early morning jerks, then they had the generalized tonic clonic. That's why usually by the time they present with a generalized tonic clonic, you can look back, ask them these other questions, they'll say yes, and you can immediately know what they have. There's a classic EEG pattern that goes with this too. They do need an EEG, but it's really beyond the scope of this talk. Just know that there's a special pattern for it as well. Lastly, for kind of syndromes of epilepsy, there are vitamin-dependent epilepsies. The most common one of these is vitamin B6-dependent epilepsy, but there are others. There are many others. Um, and it's really important to know this because the classic presentation is intractable seizure in a neonate. They're seizing, they're seizing, they're seizing. You give it to them and they stop but it can also show up in older kids. So an older kid who's seizing, might as well try it. Okay, you're not gonna lose anything. We just had a kid like this the other day. Um, it is important to be aware that vitamin supplements sometimes are medicines because I've had children come into the hospital, had their vitamins stopped and had seven seizures in four hours, okay? So in, this, in a kid like this, if they're on vitamin B6, or folic, folinic acid or something like that, that may be as important or more important than their Keppra okay, or whatever else they're on. So we're gonna talk really quick about outpatient EEG. So EEG shows neuron activity, okay? And it only shows neuron activity that's going on right now. And I know that sounds really silly and obvious, but I get a lot of questions. Did the episode that happened three days ago, was it a seizure? Well, I don't know because I didn't see it three days ago. I saw the EEG that happened when the EEG was going, okay? So it does not show what happened in the past. It doesn't show what's gonna happen in the future. It just shows if there are abnormalities that may or may not make me guess that it was or wasn't a seizure. It's a tool, okay? So if you do not ask the right information of the EEG, you're not gonna get the answer that you want, okay? It does not replace clinical history and it does not replace your judgment. We feel very driven to kind of get this information, but people who have chronic epilepsy can go 50 years and never have an EEG, okay? They can have many breakthrough seizures. So the real question is this, if I get this EEG and if I get it right now, is that gonna change what I'm gonna do? So if a patient is seizing, are you not gonna give them anything if their EEG doesn't show a seizure? If the patient looks fine and they have an abnormality on their EEG, are you gonna treat it? 
So normal EEGs also do not rule out epilepsy. So a kid has a normal EEG, people can have EEGs for also 50 years, have a normal one, and clearly have epilepsy. In fact, 10 people, 10% 10 or more of people over the course of an entire lifetime of getting EEGs who have epilepsy will still have a normal EEG. And a significant percentage of people who don't have epilepsy have abnormalities on their EEG. All EEG abnormalities are not created equal, okay? So I could have spikes on my EEG right now, but I'm not gonna take Keppra unless I have a seizure, okay? Um, the incidence of abnormalities on EEG is up to 30% in kids who have had head injuries or tumors or some kind of surgery in the past. And again, if they're not having seizures, I'm not going to treat it. So be careful what you ask, I guess, of the EEG. So treat the patient, not the EEG. If the patient is seizing, you should treat them for seizures. Okay? If the patient has an abnormal EEG but looks great, you shouldn't treat them for seizures. Okay? EEG is not indicated for the things that are on this list. Okay? And some of these have changed over the last 10 to 15 years. But if you think it's syncope, they don't need an EEG, okay? If you think it's breath-holding spells, no EEG. Ticks, no EEG. To rule out a seizure, we got an EEG to rule it out? No, it doesn't rule it out, okay? Um, headaches, don't need one. That's a change. That used to be actually endorsed by the Neurology Academy. Um, autism, learning disorders, do not need an EEG. So let's talk. We have about 20 minutes, I think. So let's talk about headaches briefly. This is just kind of an introduction to headaches from an outpatient kind of general perspective. So first, let's talk about acute headaches, okay? Because we are pediatricians, which means that people are going to show up with a first-time headache at some point, okay? So when a patient shows up with an acute headache, is it trauma? Could it be increased intracranial pressure? Do they get better when they sit up? That would be a little weird. Most people like to lay down. Could they look, do they look like they're infected? Do they have an abnormal exam? Do they have a mass lesion in their head? Do they have a clot? Or is there anything on their exam or story that makes us think it's scary? If there is, they need to go to the ED. They need to be admitted and they need to be worked up, okay? But that's not the majority of headache patients and that's not really what we're talking about in the scope of this talk. So at some point, somebody's gonna show up with their first time migraine. And the first time migraine is gonna be the worst headache of their life. Do, does every 14-year-old have a subarachnoid hemorrhage because they have the worst headache of their life? No. Almost all of them have a migraine, okay? <laughs> it is possible that you could have a subarach, so we've got to keep it in mind, but not likely. Um, so what are we going to ask about? Photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, vomiting, family history. Do they have an aura before it? Do they have visual changes with it? If they have a good chunk of this, you pretty much know it's a migraine. So a chronic headache patient, just like a chronic seizure patient, right, can also get sick. So this kid comes in, you diagnose them with migraines, they come back later, they have a worse, worse headache ever, it's different, they can still have something scary. So it's important to realize just because they have headaches doesn't mean they can't have something scary. So you have a chronic headache patient, they're coming to you, they've been having headaches for six months, whatever, they want to know what to do. You refer them to me, but I'm not going to see them for three months, so what are you going to do? First, you're going to ask them basic questions, where is it? What is it at like quality, quantity? You guys know the basic questions. And then you're going to ask them some other questions. Besides these, you're going to ask them about position. A person who likes to sit up, who their headache gets worse when they lay down, which would cause them to have it be worse in the morning usually, that's a patient I'm worried about position. I'm worried about um, increased intracranial pressure. So do they need imaging? Do they need an LP to see if they have what we call pseudotumor cerebri? Okay. Do they use over-the-counter medicines more than two to three times a week? You can get a rebound headache. It's like a caffeine headache. I didn't have my caffeine today. They didn't have their Tylenol today, so their head hurts. Okay, so that's a problem. Are they withdrawing from caffeine? That obviously can cause headaches, but a 14-year-old is sometimes not savvy enough to tell you that. We might know that, but they don't know that. Uh, vision problems are a really big one that I see a lot. And then anxiety and stress. So people will come in to a pediatrician, to a family medicine doctor, to a neurologist, but they won't go to the psychiatrist, okay? But we know that if you don't fix your anxiety and your stress, you're not going to fix your headache. Okay, so workup really depends for headaches. So if they have red flags, if you, they wake up in the middle of the night and vomit, we all know that's scary, okay? They need to be imaged. But if they don't have a red flag and they're a normal looking kid with a normal exam, they probably don't need imaging right now. I do tend to image younger kids, those that are under 8 to 10, because it's a little weird. We definitely have people who show up with headaches that are that young, but it's a little strange. 
And then a fundoscopic exam is obviously important. If you're worried at bedside that they have papilledema, they need to be seen by ophthalmology and or they need to go to the ED and get imaging, depending on how bad you think it is. Again, headaches don't need an EEG. The next two slides are not for you to memorize at all. It's just for a point. I cut and pasted this essentially from the guidelines from the Headache Society. And so migraines without aura is the most common type of migraine we see. And what I really want to point out is that to have a migraine, you need to have nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia. So all these, they all have migraines. Most people don't really have all these. So they probably don't actually qualify for a migraine syndrome. They may have a headache syndrome, but they probably don't have a migraine syndrome, okay? Some people will answer yes to these, but some won't. So then that brings us to a tension type headache, which lasts 30 minutes to seven days. I should have pointed out migraines last four to 72 hours. So these last 30 minutes to seven days, they don't have nausea or vomiting. They can have photophobia or phonophobia. This is probably more of the kids that we actually see. Like, yeah, the light hurts their eyes, but they don't vomit, they don't feel nauseous. So we're probably kind of misdiagnosing a, a fair number, and I am guilty of that myself. So. <laughs> um, so does it matter is really the question. Well, a little bit. It matters for medical records. It matters for insurance. It matters if you're a headache specialist. It matters if you want to give them a trip tan. Because a triptan helps, that's like Imitrex or Sumatriptan, that helps a migraine, but it doesn't necessarily help a chronic headache patient, okay? Does it matter about what medicine I'm gonna pick to start them on as a prophylactic? No, because most of them are the same medicines. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna start simple. And the most simple intervention I make at every headache appointment is telling them the correct dose of ibuprofen. Okay, it is unbelievable. These people are 400 pounds and they're taking one tablet. Well, that's why it doesn't work, okay? So that is, all of you can fix a headache in the next week by just asking them how much they're taking, okay? So that's my first intervention. These are pain medicines listed up here that we commonly use, okay? Ibuprofen is my favorite. I think it works better in my experience, but it doesn't have to, it depends on the person. Fioracet and Fiorinol, I will point out near the bottom of the list. People love these. People give them, the patient feels a lot better. But the problem is that they have this butalbital and that they become this vicious cycle. When they stop taking it, their headache's a lot worse and then they really want it, kind of has an addictive quality. So don't start them on that, okay? Because you will never get them off of it. And then you'll send them to me and then I'll be sad, okay? So don't do it. <laughs> All right, so triptans are the next question. So we said triptans work really well for migraines, right? We take it at the onset of a migraine and it helps. That's true, but we don't give it to certain people. So we don't give it to people who have cardiovascular disease, a history of a stroke, peripheral vascular disease. That doesn't really apply to most of our patients because we're pediatricians. But I also shy away from people who have motor problems. They don't move their arm as well, or their arm is numb during a migraine. I don't like the vascular sound of that, and so I usually shy away from giving them triptans. There's no hard data for that, but it's just kind of a style thing. Um, so typically, I will start with a trip tan at about 10 years old. I don't like to go much under that. Again, it's a little bit weird. They might have migraines, but I get a little suspicious. One trip tan may work and another one may not. There's about eight or nine well-known ones, so you can just move on down the list, okay, if one doesn't work and they can try another one. So if someone is having a migraine, they may have a lot of other things, right? They may need to go to sleep. They may need to stop their nausea. They may need whatever. So I usually kind of create this cocktail for them to take it home. And it's essentially very similar to a cocktail you give in the ED, but as the headache guy I trained with used to say, you can have your headache at home, okay? Uh, not to be mean, but there's no reason that these people can't take similar medicines at home and try to stay at home, okay? Because headaches are not really something we can just magically fix because you come into the hospital. So I will usually give people a cocktail to take home. So when you get a headache, this is what you're gonna do. And so I pick a pain medicine, usually ibuprofen. I tell them to drink a caffeinated drink at the onset, like Mountain Dew. Um, if they have a significant nausea vomiting component, I give them an anti-emetic. I will tell them if they need to go to sleep and sleep it off and they're in a position to do so, take Benadryl and hydrate themselves, okay? And they can repeat this every eight to 12 hours. So if the headache has been going on forever, you're probably not gonna stop it with ibuprofen, right? We all know chasing pain is a lot harder than just stopping it up front. And so you can try these cocktails. They can take them every eight to 12 hours. It may or may not work, okay? There's also lots of data on some different things. One is steroids. You can give IV steroids if they're in the ED. 
You can also use a Medrol dose pack, kind of doubling it to over a 12-day taper course like I've listed here, and that can help a lot, actually. Um, Midrin is a medication, with the components that are listed here, and you can also give those to repeat at home every so often. And all of these um, instructions, if you look at up-to-date, if you remember, oh, I want to try Midrin, you can look it up. Um, and that can help stop it. DHE is not indicated for children under the age of 18. Okay, and there are reasons for that. Sometimes if there's a 16 year old, we might do it. It's always done as an inpatient for children. So typically that's not really in our toolbox. A tincture of time. So people with headaches need time. And that's unfortunate, okay, but it's true. And so they will call your office three hours later if you don't set the expectation up front. So I will say when I start a prophylactic medicine, it is gonna take at least two weeks at each dose to see if it works. So two weeks from now, if it doesn't work, go up, and then a month from now you can call me, okay? Because it does take time, and they, are very, they tend to be very anxious, obviously, about their headache, they're in pain, and they will call over and over and over, and you'll feel the need to change something, but don't, okay? Give them a pattern, set the expectation, and kind of stick to it. So a patient qualifies for a medicine they're gonna take every day to prevent or decrease the frequency and severity of headaches if they're having eight to 10 headache days a month. That can be about two headaches per week or that can be one 10 day headache a month, either one. And there are a lot of different categories for prophylactic medicines and I've listed them here. There's a herbal medicine called Butterbur that was recently studied. It actually has better data than half of the medicines that we are prescribing, okay? It's a class A um, data. So this is what it's called. Um, there are some recent reports of liver problems with that, just like there are reports of liver problems with half the medicines we prescribe, okay? Ciproheptadine is a medication I commonly give the children under eight to 10. Remember how I'm saying, oh, under eight to 10, I don't know what to do? Well, I give them ciproheptadine. And a lot of them get a lot better. It is important to realize you can go up pretty high on that, okay, like 12 milligrams per day. Sometimes I see kids who are on two per day or four per day. Well, it didn't really help. Well, I don't think we've given it a fair trial. So don't be afraid to go up on it, okay? Give them time, give them two weeks, see what happens. But if it's not helping, keep going up. There's plenty of room to go up. Antidepressant category um, of medicines that we now use for headaches instead of antidepressant. Amitriptyline is our favorite. For a decent sized kid, we usually start at 25. If they're tiny, we might start at 10. Obviously, it can make them sleepy. That would be the main side effect. So we often will convert to nortriptyline if they're too groggy, groggy in the morning, but they are getting some relief from headaches. Under the anti-epileptic category, our favorite one is topiramate. There are others, right? Depakote is a classic one. Obviously, it comes with problems, especially for teenage women. Um, and then antihypertensives, there are many. Propranolol is one, but verapamil is another. Um, and again, don't up titrate too fast, okay? Each of these has a kind of a a profile for when to pick what, which is honestly we don't have time for today. This is not, again, not for you to memorize. It's just so that you know it's there. If you Google 2012 AAN migraine guidelines, you will get a paper in a PDF format. And on page four of that paper is this chart. And this chart for an adult-sized kid, which is most of our kids with headaches or decent-sized kids, We'll tell you about level A, level B, and level C evidence for each of these. And this is where you can see the butter burr is under level A, and a lot of these other medicines we just talked about aren't, okay? And sometimes I'll print this out and give it to families because they don't believe, oh, you're gonna give me a supplement or whatever, and I'll show them this is the evidence. So this is why we're picking it. So it's there for you as a resource. Lastly, we have about five minutes. Let's talk really quick about ticks. So ticks are these ongoing, recognizable kind of pattern movements that people sometimes develop. They can be motor or they can be vocal, they can be simple or they can be complex. So simple just means I just blink my eyes, complex means I blink and I turn my head and I say something all at once, okay? They change over time. So when people say, well, they used to do this, but now they do this and then they do this, well, that's normal. That's a tick disorder, okay? Um, when this happens, they often feel a kind of obsession and compulsion, okay? So the obsession is this kind of idea, I really wanna do it, I really wanna do it, and then doing it is the compulsion and they feel better after they've done it. And surprisingly small children will tell you this. You'll say, do you really wanna do it? Do you think about doing it? Yes. Do you feel better when you've done it? Yes. That might be a seven or eight year old that can tell you that, okay? So if you put it in the right way, you can really get it out of them. 
um, there is a, an ability and a desire in a lot of kids to suppress ticks. So some kids may come home and their parents will say, well, the teacher doesn't say anything about it, but they do it for an hour when they get home. Well, that's because they've been suppressing it all day. And now they're kind of letting it out and feeling better. So that's not abnormal for it to wax and wane. It is important to evaluate a kid with ticks for other causes. Do they have stimulants, okay? Are they drinking a lot of caffeine? Are they on an ADHD medication? An ADHD medication may cause ticks. Stopping it may not be the right answer, okay? It depends on the patient. If ADHD is gonna wreck their life, maybe we're willing to live with a tick, or maybe we're willing to treat a tick, okay? So it really depends on the kid. Ticks in general are transient. Not only do they change over time, but they often go away over time. And a significant number of elementary school age children will have ticks that will go away, like a significant number. So the most important thing is to not overreact to them, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. So Tourette syndrome, let's talk about that for a minute. People get really stressed out when you tell them their kid has Tourette syndrome, okay? So all it is is a motor and a vocal tick that's been happening for a year. That's all Tourette syndrome is. You can clear your throat, you can cough, you can hum, all of those are vocal tics, okay? You can even um, kind of, I guess, sniff your nose. That's a vocal tic. Um, there's also motor tics. Motor tics, like I said, can be simple, blinking or head jerking or whatever, or they can be complex, like really com complicated movements that they make. But again, one motor, one uh, vocal tic, that's Tourette's. So in my experience, tics and Tourette's are very overdiagnosed. I have an outrageous number of um, referrals for Tourette syndrome, okay? And a lot of these kids actually just have neurodevelopmental disorders, all right? If you have autism, or if you are just significantly intellectually disabled, et cetera, a lot of those kids have movements, they make noises, they have self-stimming, like it just happens. And that's not necessarily a tick, that's not necessarily Tourette's, it doesn't necessarily need treatment, okay? I'm telling you this because it's important, again, to set the correct kind of background. When a family comes to you with that concern, to not say, oh, I think you have Tourette's, you gotta go to neurology. You know, we're just throwing on medicines, but really, it's just, it's part of who they are, and that's okay. There are a lot of comorbidities that go with ticks, and I never, ever, ever to talk about the treatment plan until we've talked about ADHD, until we talked about anxiety, until we talked about OCD, okay? Never, because if these things are causing the tics, then my little treatments are not gonna help, okay? So again, as with headaches, people like to come to the neurologist, I think. Um, <laughs> it seems like it, <laughs> um, but they don't like to go to the psychiatrist, which is unfortunate. But I do not let people get out of the office who come with a tic disorder with, who clearly have anxiety and stress without telling them that they need one. And I tell them that I can't fix it without the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist cannot fix it without me. Okay, so sometimes you just really have to have that conversation. So what are we gonna do about these ticks? First, we're gonna address the underlying etiology. If they have generalized anxiety disorder, it's never gonna get better, right? We gotta treat that. Then we're gonna ignore them. So that's the next piece. People get really stressed out. Parents like, they keep doing it, they keep doing it. Well, if the kid doesn't know they're doing it, if they're not being made fun of for doing it, if they don't care, it's not hurting their neck or whatever, they don't need treatment, okay? So ignore it. Most of them will go away, and the more you talk about it, the more anxious you make them, the more they think about it, and it just goes on and on, okay? There are some kind of um, psychological therapies, like habit reversal therapy. It's hard to actually find that in terms of availability in real life, it's published in papers. Um, clonidine or 10X, which is guanefacine, is usually what I start with. And in most kids, it does make a significant improvement in kids that actually need treatment. There are some recent studies about Keppra, levetiracetam, and Topamax, topiramate, working actually for both tremor and tick. And so those are things that you can try. And then there are typical and atypical antipsychotics. The kind of classic one that people talk about is Pimazide or ORAP but there are many others down to as basic things as um, Haldol, for example. And then tetrabenazine is a really big gun movement disorder medication. So lastly, some take home points, okay? So I know we talked about a lot. I know we went through it all really fast, okay? <laughs> um, and I wish that I had more time. But if someone comes, they have a first time, they have an afebrile seizure, it's just a straight up first time seizure and they look great, they're gonna get a routine EEG, they're gonna get an MRI without contrast, they're gonna get a rescue medicine, 
but they're not going to start a maintenance medicine, right? And they're going to go home. If they have a simple febrile seizure, they're not going to get any workup. They look great, they're going to go home and hopefully never have another one. If they have a complex febrile seizure, we're going to get a routine EEG. If it's abnormal, then we will get an MRI, okay? Rescue medicines, we're probably going to use rectal diazepam. Sometimes we could argue that a different medicine like, uh, like clonopin are more helpful. Pediatric seizure syndrome, there's a bunch of them. We've touched on the top five or six that you're most likely to see, but there are others. It's important to recognize them because you are, in many cases, going to change the outcome of that kid's life if you can recognize it and recognize it early. EEG is a tool. It's not a crystal ball. I don't know what happened yesterday just as much as you don't know what happened yesterday. But um, the EEG can guide us toward or away sometimes if there are abnormalities present or not. And then, as we said, they don't rule out epilepsy because people who have clearly have epilepsy can have an EEG that is normal. For chronic headache patients, we're going to give the appropriate dose, right, of ibuprofen or of Tylenol. We're going to educate them about not taking it five times a week and causing more headaches. We're going to give them some kind of little cocktail, a plan, so when they get a headache, they can immediately start it, right? You don't want them to call you three days later. It's too late. And based on the patient's presentation, we will decide whether or not they need an MRI. For ticks, first-line treatment, besides deciding what other underlying concerns there are, is to ignore it. Okay, if it's not bothering the patient, we're going to ignore it. And that should be it. Thank you. Question. Yes. So for alties, I think, is the question. So if a kid comes in with an alti, especially a little kid, what is the role of EEG? So there is a role of EEG. It really depends on what it sounds like. If it straight up sounds like reflux, it's probably reflux, OK? But there are a significant number in papers. It's been a while since I've looked at them. A significant percentage of the causes of them do come under neurologic. It's solidly over 10%. So if you don't know, if you're totally unsure, then get a routine EEG and see what it looks like. The other thing is if they are having multiple acute life-threatening events, we might try to capture it. Like if they've had three this morning of the same event, we might put them on EEG and try to capture the event that day. But if it just happened once or it happened once and they came back three weeks later, we're probably not going to. But a routine EEG is probably a good idea. That would be, I would advise it. Right, so the, the question was, if a patient's EEG is very abnormal, but they haven't had any seizures for two years, would we still try to wean them? And the answer is, it depends, probably not. Um, so it's usually a risk-benefit discussion with the family. You'll, I'll say, I really think you're likely to have seizures again. I really don't think this is going to work. And usually I'll talk them out of trying to wean it off. And sometimes if I have a patient who's had very abnormal EEGs in the past, I'll actually repeat a routine EEG before we even decide whether or not we're going to try to wean for that exact reason. And if it's very abnormal, I often won't. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Great question. So the question is, people come from outside hospitals or they come here, they've been having long seizures. How do we define short and long was the first question. And then how would we counsel a family when they say, did this cause permanent brain damage? Or what do you think? So a short seizure is really less than 30 minutes. If it is less than 30 minutes, it's probably not going to cause brain damage. And so that's what I tell families. And a lot of families fall into that category. It's 25 minutes or whatever. I say, oh, don't worry about it. Um, then we have patients who have very long seizures. They show up, they've been having a seizure for three hours. Um, I will tell them that we get more concerned when a seizure lasts over 30 minutes than if a seizure doesn't last over 30 minutes. But the only way we will know is to see what happens when we stop it. That's what I tell them. I do, I do give them kind of a warning shot. 30 minutes is a problem. Um, and if it's going on for three weeks or whatever, you know, it's probably not good. But I kind of I kind of ride the line with that. And then you talked about also recurrent short seizures. So typically, if we're talking about short seizures, again, under 30 minutes, typically you're not going to have long-term brain damage. Now, if you're having that short of a seizure and you're having a 30-second seizure every five minutes, it might, but I don't really have good data on the individual. I think it's individual. Yeah. Other questions? No? I'd be happy to answer any other questions you have on a personal basis, but otherwise, thank you.